OK. Ben, merci beaucoup. Euh, bonjour à tout le monde. Euh, merci d'être euh, là pour euh, ce séminaire euh, conjoint euh, StatCam CRM. Donc Aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir euh, d'accueillir Dr. Simon Bonneau. Euh, Simon est professeur, donc euh, conjointement au département de biologie et au département euh, de statistiques et de sciences actuarielles à l'Université de Western Ontario. Donc, euh, Simon a eu... Euh, obtenu son, son doctorat en statistiques et sciences actuarielles à Simon Fraser University. Um, et ses recherches euh, sont centrées sur euh, le développement de méthodologies pour l'analyse de données écologiques. Donc, en particulier, euh, il s'intéresse à l'ajustement des modèles hiérarchiques dans un, dans un cadre bayésien euh, à travers euh, les, les chaînes de Markov. Et euh, ces applications, principalement, euh, se concentrent sur l'analyse de données euh, obtenues par des méthodes de capture-recapture de capture, ou Mark Recapture. Donc, euh, aujourd'hui, il va nous parler un peu de ses recherches, donc de ces dernières années, donc sur les problèmes d'identification euh, euh, dans le cadre des expériences de capture-recapture. Capture. Thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn more from your work. And uh, the floor is yours. Merci, Mamadou, pour uh, l'invitation et pour uh, l'introduction. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you all today. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, be invited. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some of my work with um, parcel identification, uncertain identification in studies of marked individuals. Um, I work particularly in the area of statistical ecology. So The work I'm going to present is all dealing with animal populations, um, but the same sorts of problems arrive in, in studies of human populations as well, when uh, you might be studying into individuals and uncertain uh, at times about the identity of those individuals. Um, I know it's, it's late into uh, November, if any of us are teaching, it's uh, crunch time for uh, classes. And so I've decided that rather than uh, sort of going in depth on a lot of the mathematics here, I'm going to uh, try and keep things um, fairly light, give a sort of broad overview of uh, the work that I've done in this area for um, going on for about the past 10 years now. And um, if anybody is in interested, I'm more than happy to answer questions about uh, more of the details or to, to speak at another time about more of the details going on here. I want to begin by um, acknowledging um, support of NSERC in particular um, as my uh, main funder for uh, this work for myself and for my students. Okay, so we're going to start today with um, an introduction, talk about uh, marker capture in general. I don't know how many people will be familiar with the methods of marker capture. So a very brief introduction to um, marker capture and um, setting up the problem that I'm sort of generally working on and then talking about the specific work that I've done in this area. So multiple marks, um, this topic called Markov bases, which uh, connected into this work, and then uh, more recent work I've been doing um, with uh, a former postdoc of mine, Wei Zhang, um, looking at saddle point approximations to, uh, to make estimates um, in these problems. Uh, one thing I meant to mention at the beginning, um, It's always nice to see uh, faces during these talks, and I like to keep them interactive if I can. If I was in a room, I'd say, you know, raise your hand. Um, feel free to use any of the reactions, or if you want to um, pop on your video, um, then I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions as I go through as well. Okay, so as I said, I work primarily in uh, statistical ecology, so um, mark recapture experiments. Um, here is uh, marking a, a common yellow throat, a type of bird that is very common in uh, Eastern North America and where all of us live. Um, and banding birds is a very classic way of uh, marking them to identify um, individuals in the future. But as I said, the sort of general ideas here uh, apply to human populations as well in terms of uh, monitoring individuals that are identifiable. Uh, in a study of human populations, we tend to refer to these as either multi-list methods or multi-systems methods, uh, because we don't like to talk about capturing and marking individuals. Okay, so I'm going to uh, introduce a very simple example to get started. So uh, I've got some area here that I'm interested in studying 
uh, the population of. There are several animals there. And um, what I'm going to do, or what researchers would do in a market capture experiment, is they would go out and they would capture individuals from the population. And the uh, base information that we get from this experiment is what we call the capture histories for these individuals. So as the experiment goes on, I'm going to build up these capture histories. And the capture histories are just strings of zeros and ones indicating when we captured individuals. Okay, so we capture the first two individuals on the first occasion and we give them marks. On the next occasion, we might recapture some individuals. So that individual one got recaptured again and we capture some new individuals like individual three down there. And we repeat this several times and build up these capture histories for the individuals in our population. Some individuals, there's one individual there that's in the population that never end up being captured. And so I have no information about that individual at all. And uh, I don't even know that it actually exists. Okay. In simple mark recapture experiments, um, we would have, if we had uh, T occasions, then there are two to the T minus one uh, observable capture histories. So with three capture occasions, there'd be seven, seven observable capture histories. Uh, there's that one more capture history, which is the one of all zeros, and that's not observable. Now, I'm only going to work in cases where we can take this data and we can summarize it by looking at the counts for each of the unique observable capture histories. Okay, so I'm not going to worry about individual heterogeneity population. There are lots of models that allow for that, but I'm going to summarize everything down to counts of those observable capture histories. I'm going to call that vector n. So n is a vector of length uh, 2 to the t minus 1. Okay. I'm also going to assume that there is some um, model for the data that we've selected, and um, the likelihood I'm just going to write as f of n given theta some set of parameters. Okay? I'm not going to specify that. So the work that I'm going to present um, is really somewhat agnostic to the specific details of that model. There are lots and lots and lots of different models that have been developed uh, over the years for marker capture data for studies of marked individuals. Okay? So the main distinguishing feature that we uh, initially teach people about is closed populations versus open populations. Open populations are ones where animals are entering the population through birth or emigration or leaving through death or immigration. And closed populations are ones where that's not happening. Okay, so within closed populations, the goal is usually to estimate the population size, and we may take into account different characteristics of the population, whether the capture probability changes over time, whether there are behavioral effects so that individuals after they're captured once become more or less catchable, et cetera. In open populations, um, Cormac Jolly Sieber model and Jolly Sieber models are the ones that are most well known. Uh, Cormac Jolly Sieber model is used for uh, estimating the survival rates of individuals. Jolly Sieber model allows us to estimate population size as well. And then there's lots of extensions of those to multi-state models where we have animals in different categories or different regions and spatially explicit models. Once again, I'm going to really just assume that we picked one of these models. Okay, And at the end of the day, all of these models end up assuming that there's essentially a multinomial structure uh, to the data. Okay? So if we ignore individual heterogeneity, then the assumption is that we have these uh, Capture histories, each one of those has a probability associated with it dependent on the parameters. And essentially all of the individuals in the population are choosing their capture history uh, separately, independently, based on whatever those probabilities are. Okay. Depending on the model, so for example, the Cormac Jolly Sieber model, we actually condition on the first time an individual is captured and released. And so there we end up with a product multinomial rather than a multimodal. In essence, the same, same sort of thing. OK, so what I'm going to talk about today are um, problems where, for one reason or another, we are uncertain about the identification of individuals in the population. Okay. And um, this work for me really started going back to a paper that was published in 2010 by um, Bill Link, who is one of the uh, big names in Bayesian analysis for marker capture data. Um, 
And he published this paper with a group of other authors about uncovering what was called a latent multinomial uh, model. I'm going to talk about that. Um, so their analysis was looking at uh, these salamanders. And in order to study these salamanders, they didn't use uh, physical marks. Um, you can see it would probably be uh, very invasive to actually mark one of these individuals in some way. And so instead, they used genetic analysis. And um, the problem they faced was that uh, you may end up with a situation which is called allelic dropout. So allelic dropout is where you do the genetic fingerprinting and one of the alleles uh, drops out and essentially you end up with the uh, wrong identity for the individual. Okay. So here is uh, my area again and I've got this uh, population of salamanders now that I'm interested in and I do the same sort of thing. I go out and I capture individuals and I record whether or not uh, they've been captured on each occasion. What happens in this situation is that sometimes you misidentify the individuals. Okay? So that's what the yellow box is supposed to signify here that uh, that salamander, which was given the mark number one, has been misidentified. And now we think it's a new individual. And so we give it a new mark, which is mark number four. Right. So rather than having individual one being captured twice, it looks like we have individual one being captured once, individual four being captured once. And we go ahead and do it again. This time we recapture a new individual. Now we're going to call that individual five. And then uh, we capture individual two, but we misidentify it. We give it a new name as individual six. And again, you can see the sort of problem that's happening here. Now, in this very simple case, we actually have more capture histories than we have individuals in the population. And right? so if we are going to make any estimate of the size of the population, we're definitely going to overestimate. And more than that, because we start moving these capture events out of uh, individual capture histories, we've inflated the number of zeros, the number of missed captures. And so we're going to end, end up underestimating the capture probability. And that's going to lead us to overestimate the population size even more. So what Bill suggested is that rather than modeling the counts of the uh, observed capture histories directly, we define this latent structure. Right? And this is where this latent multi multinomial piece comes in. So we're going to introduce a new uh, state, a new possible um, entry into the capture histories, which is this uh, entry two. Okay? So we have zero if the individual is not captured, one if the individual is captured and correctly identified, and two if the individual is captured and misidentified. Now, obviously, we can never know if an individual is correctly identified or misidentified, so these are going to be latent variables, okay? and we're going to end up with these latent histories for each individual, these true capture histories representing what actually happened when they were captured and whether or not they were identified correctly. Okay. I'm going to introduce this new um, vector x, which is going to count the number of times that these true histories occurred. So once again, this is a latent variable, and right? we have no way of observing it, um, except by making inference through what we actually observed in the counts n. Okay. So in this situation, if we were to look at the, the true latent capture histories for each of these individuals, individual one was captured on all three occasions, misidentified on the second occasion. So its latent history would be one, two, one. And then individual two was captured on the first and third occasions. It was misidentified. So we'd have that one, zero, two. The model that uh, Bill proposed, um, so he proposed a specific case of this late multinomial model. And the assumptions he made were that errors occur independently with probability alpha on each capture. So every time an individual is captured, there's some probability of allelic dropout and we misidentify an, ind an individual. He assumed that uh, errors always create new identities and that they can't be repeated. And this really comes from that genetic component. So the idea is that when looking at a genetic fingerprint with a very large number of genes, uh, the chances of an error matching another individual that you've already captured are very, 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 very small. And so the assumption is that they're going to just create some new identity that doesn't match anybody else. What this ends up doing is inflating the number of capture histories where you only have 
one capture. Okay, so each error is going to lead to a new capture history where you only have one capture and you can use information from those extra uh, counts to estimate what's going on. Okay, so we're going to assume that that uh, latent vector X is now multinomial given both the parameters and alpha. And the second piece of this is that you can formulate very easily a uh, linear um, function between what you actually observed and that latent count uh, vector of counts X. Okay, so there's some matrix A there, and that matrix is known as a matrix of zeros and ones in this case, which indicate which of the latent histories contribute to each of the observed histories. This is what the likelihood looks like. So if we wanted to compute the likelihood of the observed counts in this case, how do we do that? Well, we have to find all of the vectors of counts for the latent histories that could have given us the observed histories. And we sum up the likelihood contributions of those. And that gives us the likelihood contribution of the observed data. The challenge with this is that identifying all of those vectors can be very, very challenging. There are a very large number of those vectors, uh, possible vectors X that give, give you N. And um, even if you could compute them, um, because there's a lot of them, doing this sum on every iteration of some optimization algorithm is going to be, a, be very computationally expensive. So what Bill proposed and said was to move to a uh, Bayesian framework. So in the Bayesian framework, this is the classic situation when we've got something like this, we're going to work with the complete data likelihood, okay, which is given by this. Okay. And then the posterior distribution. So if we end up with some, if we uh, specify some priors on the parameters theta and alpha, then we can get the posterior distribution of theta, alpha, and that vector x. The second piece that um, Bill really brought to this is uh, that he developed this very nice uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling algorithm for exploring uh, the possible solutions to X. And it's based on finding a basis um, for the null space of that matrix A. So some set of vectors, B1 through BK. So each of those is within the null space. A times BK is equal to the zero vector, and that any other um, vector within the null space uh, can be written as a linear combination of those uh, vectors. Okay. And the key thing is, if you already have one solution and you take a vector from the null space and add it, then you get to a new solution. Okay. Adding a vector from the null space doesn't change the solution of that linear equation. Okay, so what we can do in terms of um, MCMC sampling, what Bill proposes. First, we have to identify the basis for the null space, and then we're going to go through and uh, sample. Okay? Depending on what the model is, you're going to sample the parameters, theta, and in this case, alpha. Okay? And then in order to update uh, the vector x, the count of the uh, latent uh, histories, you're going to go through and add multiples of those basis functions one at a time to generate new proposals and then do the classic metropolis hasting thing, accept or reject the new proposal, and then keep going through with the algorithm. Okay. Those values, um, that value dk minus dk up to dk is a tuning parameter. And so you can tune that in order to take, make your MCMC sampling more efficient. Okay, so um, that was what Bill proposed in 2010. And I'm gonna talk about sort of my first um, entry into uh, this area of research, which is dealing with this problem of multiple marks. Okay. And uh, it came about when I was contacted by a guy called Jason Holmberg, who um, he's not actually a scientist by training. He uh, ran this on the side. He ran a, uh, a website still does called whalesharkorg and um, what it does is it collects uh, photographs of whale sharks that are taken by tourists. So people who go uh, snorkeling um, in Australia, California, off the coast of the Philippines, take pictures of whale sharks, and then they upload them to this website. And this website uses an AI pattern matching algorithm to identify whale sharks. Okay, so here's one whale shark that was photographed off the coast of Australia. Uh, first time in June of 2010, okay? and then it was re-photographed in uh, July of 2018 as well. It was actually photographed 
several times um, between them, them as well. Okay? And if you do sort of squint closely at these pictures, you can see that the, the uh, patterns there are um, actually the same. The problem in this case is that uh, these patterns are kind of like fingerprints. So uh, you can match a fingerprint to itself, but you can't match a fingerprint from one finger to the fingerprint of another finger. And exactly the same problem happens here. Uh, you can match the fingerprint or the uh, photograph from a left side of the shark to another photograph of the left side of a shark. You can't match photographs from the left side of the shark to photographs of the right side of a shark. Um, so what do what happens here? Um, in this case, what happens is that we may have capture histories that end up dividing into two and creating, once again, multiple capture histories in our data set. Okay. So I'm letting here left, R, L for left, R for right, B for both, denote whether or not an individual is captured from the left or from the right, or both simultaneously. So in some cases, uh, tourists take photographs of both sides. They upload pictures of both sides, and they say, these are photographs from both sides of the same shark. And in that case, we are able to match. Okay. So the first history only involves lefts. It would give us one history. The second history only involves right photographs. It would also give us one history. And the third history there, L-O-R-B, because it contains a both, okay, we can match the left and the right in the previous uh, photographs and get down to one history. But that final history, uh, L-O-R-O, -O, would give us two histories in the observed data set, one with a left photograph, one with a right photograph, and there's no way of matching these two. So when I um, started working on this problem, there were two solutions that had been proposed. Um, one of the solutions was simply to work with one side, either the left side or the right side. So Jason and his group had picked the left side, and they threw away all of the right side photographs. Okay? That works in terms of it gives you proper inference, um, but you're potentially throwing away half of your data at that point. The other proposal that has been, had been suggested was to work separately with the left sides and the right sides to get estimates for each of those data sets, and then to compute an estimate of whatever parameter you're interested in by averaging those together and compute standard errors simply by adding the variances from what you get from the left side and what you get from the right side. Okay. And um, we all know that that's not the right thing to do because it misses the covariance term. And okay. so uh, the assumption there is that the left side of whale sharks and the right side of whale sharks are independent. And uh, well, that's clearly not too true. Clearly the left side and the right side of whale sharks uh, move around together and are photographed together. Okay. What I did at this point was essentially to apply the algorithm that uh, Bill Link had developed. So this fits directly into that latent multinomial framework. Okay. We can imagine this latent vector uh, counting the true histories and apply exactly the method that he developed. Okay. Things got a bit more interesting later on, though, when I was working with um, one of my colleagues uh, and when I was at the University of Kentucky, uh, who also worked in statistical ecology. Um, so his name is Matt Schofield. And um, he actually attended, or he was an examiner on the defense of a PhD student in the department uh, who was working with uh, another researcher, um, Rudy Yoshida. And, um, the problem in this PhD thesis was about how to sample uh, contingency tables that met certain constraints. Okay? So if you put, assume that certain cells in the con contingency table sum up to certain values, how can you sample contingency tables that satisfy those constraints? Okay? And it turns out that this is um, exactly connected to the type of thing that we are doing. Okay, so here's an example. Um, so suppose that we wish to sample right, values within this table that satisfy the following marginal constraints. Okay, so we need the top row to add to five, the middle to add to three, and then two, and then we need the columns to add to zero, four, and six. Um, we have six constraints here, but we really only need five uh, because 
if you know the column sums or the row sums, then you can always get that last value. So I'm just going to work with the values 5, 3, 2, 0, 4. So we have five constraints there. Exactly as in the uh, latent multinomial model, we can write this out as a linear system. Okay, so we have this vector of constraints n, that 5, 3, 2, 0, 4, and then we have this matrix that tells us how those counts contribute to, uh, to those constraints. Okay, so within A, the first three values have to add to 5, that's the top row, the next three values have to add to 3, the last three values have to add to 2, etc. Okay, so it ends up being almost exactly the same problem. Those vectors X on the sides are two possible solutions to uh, this linear system. Okay, so if you take those vectors X, you multiply them by A, then you end up satisfying the constraints. So what's the problem here? The problem arises if you try and take this and feed it into Bill's algorithm in order to sample from the possible solutions for uh, this system of equations. Okay, so what Bill said to do is that we would find a basis for the null spaces, base, null space of A, and then we would add multiples of those vectors onto the X's in order to move through the possible solutions. Okay, so here is a uh, basis for uh, that matrix. Okay, so each of these basis vectors has two ones and two minus ones, and what essentially does is sort of uh, flips across a square. Okay, so if you sort of flip one row and one column and flip, uh, sorry, flip two columns and flip two rows, then you can end up satisfying the constraints still. Um, so that's sort of what each of these does. Okay. The problem is that we not only need the x's to be solutions, because they are counts, we need them to be non-negative. And if we take these vectors b and we try to add them onto either x1 or x2, it doesn't matter which, Okay. we end up in a situation where we get negative counts. Okay. So no matter what, there's always a one and a minus one that line up with one of the zeros in the solutions. And that means we can neither add or subtract from those solutions. If we were to start off with one of these solutions and use this null basis, we would be stuck at that solution. And in terms of MCMC sampling, we would never make it anywhere else. Okay. Alternatively, if we started somewhere else and we use this basis, we would never be able to find these solutions. So the problem here is that if you do MCMC sampling, as Bill proposed, that you may end up in a case where your Markov chain is not irreducible, it's reducible. And so you only end up sampling from part of the sample space of the posterior distribution. And the piece that you sample from depends on where you start. What you need to do to solve this is to add more vectors into that basis in order that you can expand and move through all of those points. In this case, to solve this problem and be able to reach all of the possible solutions, you need nine vectors instead of four. And this gives us what is called a Markov basis. And this actually goes back to work of um, Percy Diaconis and Bern Sturmfels uh, back in the late 1990s. They um, discovered this and um, and it's fundamental to uh, what is now the area of algebraic statistics. Okay. So we started looking at whether or not this was an issue. And we started off first looking at um, the problems that we'd worked with so far. So that latent multinomial of Bill Links working with the model he proposed for those salamanders and applying it to my model for the whale sharks. Okay. What we discovered is that Bill's, Bill's method for sampling does actually work in those cases. And we were able to classify these as what we call simple corruptions. Okay, so essentially, uh, in this problem, the data is corrupted in some way. And a simple corruption, we said, occurs if one true capture history splits apart and results in two or more observed capture histories. So in the multiple marks temp, uh, example with the whale sharks, you take photographs from the left and the right, and if they are combined in one history, they split apart into two histories. If your problem only includes simple corruptions, then we were able to show that uh, what is called a lattice basis, just the standard basis of the null space, is also a Markov basis. 
it will allow you to connect the entire space. And we can actually go a little further than that. Rather than just classifying it in terms of marker capture methods, we were able to class, uh, characterize um, how A would need to look in order for this to be true. Okay, so if A contains only the values 0 and 1, and it also contains all the columns of the identity matrix, then a null a basis for the null space is a Markov basis. It gives you an irreducible Markov chain. Okay, so the obvious next question was whether or not we could find a model where this didn't happen. And what we need to do is something that doesn't involve simple corruptions. And that means that we need to have problems in identification, which involve multiple individuals. Okay, and so the example we came up with is what we call the band read error model. Okay, and the idea in the band read error model is that we have both true negative and, or sorry, true and false, uh, true negative and positive and false negative and positive captures. All right, so we have true negative is not captured, true positive is you're captured and you're correctly identified. But then we have false negative when you're captured and not identified correctly. And what that does is makes it appear that somebody else was captured. So false positive is when you weren't captured, but it looked like you were captured because somebody else was captured and identified as you. Okay. So what this does is rather than just creating those new capture histories, it's moving capture events from one history to another history. Okay. We'll look at something like this. Okay, so uh, in terms of these events, zero, uh, one, zero, one, two, and three, if we look at those last pair of true histories, we might have a case where that two, as an individual that was captured and misidentified, it appears to move that capture event over to the third capture history. Okay, so that third individual is really only captured on the first two occasions, but it appears that it was captured on all three occasions. We call this the band read error model because this is the sort of thing that would happen if you were reading those bands, like I showed at the very beginning, putting on a bird's leg. Okay, you might misread a three as an eight, or you might misread a um, one as a seven. Okay, and if you do that, then you may read off a band number that actually belongs to another individual. Okay. Assumptions again here are that errors uh, occur with probability alpha on each crap capture. Okay? But in contrast to Bill, where he assumed that errors always create new identities, we assume that errors never create new identities. The reason for that is, again, thinking of bands, uh, errors that create brand new identities are very easy to weed out because if you're banding birds, you know what bands you put out. So if you come up with a new identity and it doesn't match anything you've put out on a bird's leg, you can just remove that, you know it must have been an error. The only errors you're gonna keep are those ones that do match other individuals. The final thing we need to assume, and this is a, definitely a simplification, is that errors cannot be recorded multiple times on one occasion, right? Otherwise we have a case where we have multiple captures of the same individual or apparently multiple captures and the system is no longer linear. So we can't use those methods. All right, so what happens in this case? So um, we can go ahead and compute um, the Markov bases that we need in order to generate irreducible Markov chains and sample from the entire posterior distribution. Okay. Um, there's actually a computer program that has been written to do this um, called 4T2. And um, you can go ahead and, and apply it. You just supply it your matrix, uh, your A matrix, and it goes ahead and computes the, the Markov basis. If an experiment has three occasions like the one I showed, then uh, we have seven observable histories. Um, there are 21 possible true histories for the band read error model. The lattice basis has 12 elements, but that's not sufficient. And we have to go up to a Markov basis with 63 elements in it. That works in the case of t equals three. If we go to the case of t equals five, then um, at the time that I was writing this, uh, my computer only had eight gigabytes of RAM. And um, we couldn't compute the Markov basis in that case. Okay. A lot of capture recapture experiments have um, far more than five occasions. And in that case, even with bigger computers today with lots more memory, it's simply not possible to compute the Markov basis. And so although this was a really nice um, sort of solution in principle, uh, 
in application, it really ends up with just another problem. Okay. Thankfully, there was a solution out there, and it comes in the form of what are called dynamic Markov bases. And this goes back to some work that was done by Adrian Dobra um, in 2012. Okay. And the idea of a dynamic Markov basis is that rather than pre-computing that entire Markov basis, and when you're at each specific point, you're going to compute a small set of these vectors. They're called moves in the terminology of algebraic statistics. And if you do that in the right way, you can select from that small set and move somewhere else and then reselect another dynamic Markov basis. And that will allow you to move through the entire space. So essentially, instead of computing the entire Markov basis all at once, as you work through the problem, you're computing little pieces of the Markov basis that allow you to transition within little local regions. And in the end, that connects you everywhere. Okay, so dynamic Markov basis is some collection of moves for each possible solution and really a rule for computing these at each possible solution. Okay. What do you need to do now? Essentially the same thing as Bill proposed, except rather than working through all of those vectors in the Markov basis in order to generate new proposals, you're just going to sample elements from that dynamic Markov basis conditional on where you are at the specific time. In terms of the band read better model that um, we've been looking at, it turns out that there is a very simple uh, way of generating these dynamic Markov bases. And um, in the end, I think it's fairly intuitive. So if you either add or remove an error wherever you are at any point, then that will allow you to move through the entire space. And the proof of this is fairly intuitive. The, there's always one solution, which is the solution with no errors in it at all. Okay. And so if you've got moves that allow you to remove errors, then you can always work back to that unique solution with no errors in it at all. And once you've done that, you can sort of go off on another branch somewhere to get to any other point in the space. And so it kind of creates the spider webs. There are actually connections between the arms of the spider webs if you do this. So uh, that helps with the efficiency. But in terms of proving that the um, sampler is irreducible, that's all you need. Okay, so in theory, again, that, that works, um, but it does take uh, quite a long time. Um, so doing the uh, MCMC here is, um, is not overly computationally efficient. And again, with these spaces tend to be very large and um, adding or subtracting uh, errors one at a time is just making very small moves through the, uh, the sample space of the posterior distribution. And so you have to run these algorithms for a very, very long time to really ensure that you are sampling from the entire posterior distribution. Okay. So the next piece of work, as I mentioned, is um, work with a postdoc of mine who uh, joined me here at Western in 2018. Um, and he had actually come from uh, doing his PhD with another researcher in, um, in ecological statistics who um, they had been looking at using saddle point approximations to solve this instead. Okay. So the saddle point approximation, I'm not sure if people will be familiar with it or not. This is what the saddle point approximation allows you to do is to approximate the uh, density distribution function um, given the moment generating function of a random variable. Okay. So if you have some random variable x, and you know it's moment generating function, but you don't know it's PDF, then you can approximate the PDF by the formula there. Okay, and it depends upon this point S hat, which is called the saddle point um, of, the, of the approximation. And this turns out to be um, fairly straightforward to apply to this latent multinomial model, okay? Because X is, generally multinomial, okay? And in Bill Link's original problem or in my problem with the whale shark, it is multinomial, okay? Then it's very easy to write down what the moment generating function of X is. And by virtue of the fact that we have a formula for the moment generating function of linear transformations of random variables, we can easily get at the uh, 
uh, moment generating function of the observed vector n. And once we do that, then we simply plug this into the saddle point approximation. And now depends on n and theta, but this gives us an approximation to the likelihood. And we can use optimization techniques to uh, get parameter estimates through standard maximum likelihood estimation. And at that point, we can do the usual things of uh, computing confidence intervals and standard errors by uh, inverting the Hessian matrix and taking square roots of the, uh, the diagonal elements, et cetera. Okay. The advantage of this is that it avoids uh, the need to do that complex MCMC sampling. And, um, and uh, it turned out to be very, very, very fast and very, very, very accurate as well. So, um, oh, I sort of said this, I guess. So uh, I've just written down the log likelihood there, which is simply the log of the, uh, the saddle point approximation. Right? And um, when Wayne joined me, so he and Rachel Fuster had been applying this to model MT alpha. Right? And um, in that case, X is uh, exactly multinomial. And so you can do this uh, very easily. We looked at the case of the band read error model. And that's what the reference I gave you was. In the case of the band read error model, uh, X no longer has exactly a multinomial distribution because you're moving these uh, capture events from one history to another, you end up breaking the multinomial uh, covariance structure. So in particular, you need to have the same number of false negatives and false positives. And so that sets up an extra constraint in the distribution and it's no longer exactly multinomial. However, as long as the error rate isn't too high, you can approximate this by the multinomial and things work out very well. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna end very quickly talking about some further work that I'm doing with um, Wei and um, just another model that we're adapting this for. So this is a study of uh, these tiny little frogs. They're called golden mantella. They are, um, endemic to Madagascar and now highly endangered. And um, the study that was done didn't actually use um, unique marks for these individuals. Instead, it used what was called uh, batch marks. So batch marks are where you use the same mark for often all individuals captured on one occasion or a series of occasions. Okay. And the reason for doing this is often because otherwise it would be too invasive or if individuals are very small, you just can't mark them individually. Okay, so same sort of thing. Here is my study area. Okay, I go out and I capture some individuals on the first uh, occasion. Okay, so this study was actually broken. There were six occasions which were broken into three periods and they use a distinct colored mark within each of those two periods. Okay. So we capture one frog and it gets a yellow mark. Okay, we capture another frog and it gets a yellow mark. The numbers I'm showing here, the one slash zero, the one represents a capture of a new individual and the zero represents the recapture of an individual. Okay. On the next occasion, we don't capture any new individuals, we recapture an individual, so we get that zero, one. The problem is because both of those frogs that we've already marked have yellow marks, we don't actually know which of the frogs we captured. We don't know if it's the one we captured on the first occasion or the one we captured on the second occasion. All we know is it's one of the individuals we captured before. Okay, so we can keep going through this all six occasions and we end up with data like this. Okay. So once again here, we end up in a situation where we don't know what the individual's capture histories actually were. Okay, there's lots and lots and lots of possible underlying true capture histories that could have led to the same pattern of marking and recapturing those marks when we're using batch marks rather than having individual identifications. Okay. So I'm coming up on my time, I know, and it is a Friday afternoon. So I will end there and say uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. And uh, I'm very happy to answer uh, any questions if there are any. Merci beaucoup, Simon. Euh, merci. Vous avez, merci, très belle présentation. Donc, si vous avez des questions, euh, vous pouvez euh, lever votre main ou euh, activer votre micro euh, pour parler directement avec Simon.
Euh, moi, j'aurais une question à Louis-Paul Louis Arrida ici. Bonjour, Simon. Bonjour, Louis-Paul. Ça va? Ça va bien, merci. Oui. Euh, moi, j'ai une question euh, concernant l'exploration le, 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 de l'espace des matrices là, au début, euh, ben, à peu près à la milieu de l'exposé. Uh, so, so, yes, I have a question about the exploring the space of matrices. Mm -hmm. I was, I mean, couldn't you do this with the multivariate hypergeometric distribution? Because, because when you have a, you, you have a, 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 a matrix of, uh, of integer with uh, the, the, the row sums are fixed and the column sums are fixed, then, I mean, this, this is related to the multivariate hypergeometric distribution. So this is my question. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and the task is to sample from that uh, multivariate hypergeometric distribution. Um, yes. And that is not an easy problem. Uh, no, it's a, no, no, I don't agree with you. OK. Just, yes, you, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, uh, I mean, it was a long time ago, but I mean, Agresti, for instance, is, I mean, you, you basically what you have to do is to simulate a permutation. And then, uh, and then you can, and then you, 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 you part a, a very large permutation, and then you partition everything, and then you simulate uh, the multivariate geometric. Uh, it's quite, uh, it's relatively straightforward. Yes. But anyway, no, but so uh, this is just, no, so this is a comment. And then maybe another question as well about, uh, about when, so when you, if I'm right, when you apply the, the, the saddle point approximation, then uh, this is, um, I think now you're not Bayesian anymore, aren't you? No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So everything we're doing with the saddle point approximation is frequentist. There would be nothing to stop you from doing a Bayesian analysis with the saddle point approximation. Yeah. If you've got an approximation to the likelihood, you could equally well do a Bayesian analysis. But everything we've done with it so far is frequentist. Yeah. Okay. Thank so. You. Please send me if you can. A I, will send, because, I mean, I've been working on a related problem, and I will send you my R code. You could, you can try my R code to sample the the uh, the multivariate hypergeometry. Plus a, a paper if you want, but I have I have the code is there. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'd be very interested. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, thank you, Lupo. Um, so I have a question regarding the silicon approximation. So, so do, do you have dimensionality issues in page 34? Like if you, for example, using model MT, um, so, so, so what that, what does, um, how, how does the design matrix looks like? Because I guess you might have some dimensionality issues, right? No? Yeah, that's okay. So that's very interesting. Um, yes. So uh, it didn't come up in the initial work that we'd done, um, but that actually came up with the, the Mantellas. And um, what happened there, uh, the data is collected over um, several years with multiple capture events each year. And uh, we do end up with a dimensionality problem. Um, the way we've gotten around that is to uh, do a uh, pre-filtering of the possible latent histories, right? So if you um, have some good guesses to begin with at the values of the parameters, and you can you can get these from the data, um, then you can go through those those possible uh, latent capture histories, and you can look at their probabilities and um, and, and most of them you'll find out actually have probability very close to zero. And so what we've done is to remove um, all of them below some threshold, and then that greatly reduces the problem down. So yeah, so we've ended up, we, we initially ended up with a, a situation where we went from the, uh, the Bayesian solution, which was very slow, um, but ran on, on a nice personal computer, to uh, the saddle point approximation was very fast, but we had to run it on the um, the high performance computing cluster here because we needed 128 gigs of RAM to, uh, to solve the problem. And, um, and so, yeah, so then we've, we've done this step of pre-filtering and, and that has been a huge success. Yeah. Oh, 
That's great. Um, D'autres questions? Any other questions? Uh, one here from Jim Hanley. Uh, I saw at one point you were talking about sampling from tables with constraints. Um, and I've run into a problem that it, the data are so old that the people who created it are all dead. And they've given us a three dimensional, what we're looking for is a three dimensional frequency table of the order of two by about 20 by about 20. And what we've were kept, what was kept and published in the paper was the two dimensional marginals. Okay, but not the full three dimensions. So right. I have two, two, I have all three two dimensional margins, but no third margin. And the data are quite sparse in some places, where it's, so I may actually be able to work it out just by trial and error. But for the middle of the table where there are big counts, uh, I'm stuck. And it's a very important old paper in genetics, and I would love to get it right, but we've searched everywhere. Would any of uh, your methods apply to this? I know it's, a, it's quite a ways away, but... Yeah, no, I absolutely, I, I think so. So that really, so that really belongs to um, this sort of area of algebraic statistics. And, I see. Um, yeah. and I mean, everybody has warned me there's not a unique solution. And I said, I'd be happy to get any solution. Right. So, point. yeah, I think so that the challenge. Uh, sorry, uh, my uh, everything. Oh. The, the challenge, at least from everything I presented, is that it's always, if you have one solution, then we can get you to other solutions or get you to all of the solutions, right? Um, so if the challenge is that you don't have a solution at all, um, that is a, an interesting problem. Okay, I'll send yeah. it to you. I'll send it to you to look at. Yeah, it's a challenge. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think these sort of, um, you know, the, the the sort of general idea shows up in a lot of places. Um, the, you know, the original use of it was for extensions of um, of Fisher's exact test. Right. So Fisher's exact test. How do we perform that? Mm -hmm. You, you think sure. of all tables that satisfy some constraints and you compute some summary statistic and you compare your summary statistic to uh, yeah. to the distribution. And that becomes very hard in high dimensional tables, exactly like you're talking about. Yeah, mine is, is more just that uh, there's no estimation. Well, the estimation is working out those fine detail of the third dimension. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not about any statistics. It's, a, it's trying to get back to the raw data, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, yeah, I'd be very interested. Yeah, yeah. There is another one, but it's uh, more to do with your animal studies, but a, a, a different situation. It seems like this business of capturing and uh, recapturing animals is tricky um, when you're using GPS and things like that. I've seen one very important paper recently looking at um, whether badgers get TB from the cows or the cows get the TB from the badgers. And the issue is whether, um, how close the badgers come to cows and they put GPSs on them, but didn't have enough batteries to have the GPS on the whole time. And so we have some of the time when we're missing whether the cows come close, whether the badgers come close to the cows and so on. It was a budget issue of mm -hmm. having a, a, enough GPS, and enough batteries to, make sure that the, all the badgers and all the cows were being tracked all the time. And they ended up with big holes in the data uh, hmm. for the same reason. Yeah. Hmm. And so they're trying to show that a, badgers have never come within six feet or five meters or something of cows, but they can't be sure because right. so far in the data they do have, there is no instance of proximity of that degree. But Social they distance. can't say for sure. Yeah, Social yeah, the, very much. Badgers. Yeah, yeah. They like to come into the pastures where the cows are, but at night when the cows are asleep, and vice versa. But uh, it's been tricky, and it it would solve a major issue in 
the epidemiology of TB and badgers, whether in fact they spread it directly to the cow or some other way. Hmm. Hmm. I'll send you that paper too, see if you can help them. Thank you. Okay, um, merci beaucoup. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions pour Simon? Bah, S'il n'y en a pas, on va, on va encore remercier Simon pour une, une excellente présentation. Euh, merci à tout le monde d'avoir été là. Donc, merci, uh, Simon. Uh, thank you again uh, for your presentation. Uh,